Summer is supposed to be an opportunity to slow down. But when you look at your kids, you can't help but notice that your kids are growing up fast. Help them build independence as they grow with Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app for families where parents can keep an eye on kids' money habits while kids learn how to save, invest, and spend wisely. It's the easy, convenient way to raise financially smart kids. Get your first month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. He says, sir, I have never seen Babylon and I know nothing about the den. Then the angel of the Lord took him by the crown of his head and carried him by his hair. <laughs> so the angel was just like, <laughs> nope, you you're stupid coming. little... <laughs> He's kind of like, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and combat the spread of that pesky misinformation about the same. How are things today, Dan? Uh, good, good. Just uh, having a, a lovely time. Uh, you and I are recording this well before it's going to be coming out because we're all going on trips and we're going to be having yeah. fun times. So yep. though we only have things to look forward to now. <laughs> By the time this comes out, I will probably be, I might be in San Diego for the San Diego Comic-Con. I don't know when this is going to come out. Or it, or it will have out. already happened. And who, who knows? Who yeah. knows? Yeah. We'll, we'll both be tan. You never know. I I will probably be just as white as now, just because I'm <laughs> I'm so susceptible that I just drench myself in sunscreen um, whenever I remember, and because uh, the last thing I need is another sunburn. I I grew up like uh, perpetually peeling dead skin off yeah. of uh, old sunburns. So yeah, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's lovely. That's always fun. Yeah, that's always fun. <laughs> I did see a thing just. Uh, this is not relevant to our show, but I just saw a, a thing uh, that there's a, a new vaccine for skin cancer that they've been working on. Really? And, yeah, an mRNA thing that that has been very effective for stopping melanomas and stuff. So maybe Good it'll grief. save you. I, Who knows? Man, wish I would have known about that in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> right? Um, good night. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know anything more about it than that, but I'm sure it will... I'm sure there will be conspiracy theories about it soon. <laughs> uh, coming up on today's show, we are going to be looking at a couple of really interesting things. First of all, uh, we are going to be diving into the uh, the creation of the universe, you guys. Ooh. So that's pretty fancy. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but um, it was us. It was me and Dan. <laughs> we, we built it. Uh, and then after that, one of the lesser known but fascinating uh books of the apocrypha we're gonna we're gonna get we're i, I always want to say bell and sebastian but we're doing bell and the dragon bell and the dragon and not not technically its own book but one of the additions to the book of daniel so we'll talk we'll talk about that when we get how there. dare you sir how <laughs> dare you oh why deny dare. it deny it its book status uh <laughs> but yes it, it's it, it's a fun one you're gonna want to stick around yeah uh but first, let's let's launch into creation stories. Dun, dun, dun. Creation ex nihilo, to be more specific. We've yeah. we've talked about some creation accounts before, and we've talked about, uh, in fact, I think our very first episode of this podcast, um, we talked about Genesis one one, and one of the things that we pointed out is that correctly interpreted. Uh, there's no creation ex nihilo going on there. That everything yeah. seems to have been created from the the chaotic, murky uh, waters of creation that probably had uh, some kind of unformed earth submerged beneath them. 
uh, and creation was a process of separating things out, light and dark, water from water, dry land from water, and, and so on and so forth, and thus and so. Um, but when we get a little closer to the New Testament, we get some passages that people uh, who are willing to give a little on creation ex nihilo in Genesis 1.1 these passages people are a little more strict about. They're a little let's, more insistent. Let's before we get too far into this, let's define ex nihilo as So a, as yeah, a, creation ex nihilo is is uh, half of a uh, half of it is Latin, um out of nothing. Uh and this is the idea that the universe was created from nothing, that God brought all the material that makes up the universe into existence from Nothing. Right. And so, therefore, God is the ultimate creator of and source of all matter that exists. And yeah, and it's so funny. Like, like, like you say, the that Genesis one creation story, it is clear that it's not from nothing. There is, there's already plenty of something Mm -hmm. when that starts. But boy, man, if you. If you get into an argument with a young earth creationist online, ex nihilo is the only way to go. Absolutely. And there's a reason for this. And uh, this is something that I talk, we've talked about in some of the uh, other videos, particularly where we talked about monotheism with uh, David Burnett. Mm. Uh, when we get the development of monotheism, part of the requirement is that you have creation ex nihilo. Because if not, then you had something that existed apart from God eternally, and there's a question of uh, how God can have sovereignty over all of matter if it is co-equal and co-eternal with God. And so part of the doctrine of monotheism is relying upon the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. So this is pretty important, but the question is, when do we get it? And uh, a lot of people think it's in the Bible— or maybe in the Apocrypha, but mm. uh, the academic consensus right now is that we don't get it until the last couple of decades of the second century CE. What? So like, like 180 CE is probably where we first see any clear articulation of the idea that God created everything out of nothing. How so, dare you? Uh, oh, I, I, I dare. Not in the Bible. <laughs> Oh, there's so much that's not in the book. But um, usually when you point out that you don't have creation ex nihilo in Genesis, people are like, fine, but it's in 2 Maccabees 7.28, and don't you dare try to tell me it's not. And 2 okay, so Maccabees... We're, we're diving right back into that uh, that old apocrypha. Yeah, uh, we're going to get apocryphal on your uh, butt, so to speak, <laughs> to uh, uh, to paraphrase the, uh, the great poet. Uh, <clears throat> in... Chapter 7 of 2 Maccabees is one of the most fascinating stories, I think, in, in all of 2 Maccabees. If you've never read First and 2 Maccabees, you've really got to. Because this is, uh, a lot of this is, is um, agreed to be historical. This is about this great battle, series of battles between uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, the Seleucid ruler, and the Jewish people in the 160s BCE. And the story in chapter 7 is not historical. Uh, It's usually referred to as the mother and her seven sons. And the idea is that uh, the Seleucid ruler was trying to force people to uh, consume pork uh, and force them to offer sacrifices to other gods and everything like that in an effort to try to stamp out Judaism. Mm. And in this chapter, we have a story where Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, comes upon uh, a mother and her seven sons, youngish sons, and one by one tortures each of her sons and then kills them mm. because they refuse to uh, violate their, the laws of, uh, of their, their people, yeah. uh, the Jewish uh, purity laws. And each time the mother exhorts the sons before they are killed to remain faithful. And there are a series of promises and statements uh, that go into this. In verse 28, we have uh, this statement that uh, she says, I beseech you, child, to look toward heaven and earth and on seeing all that is in them, to know that God did not make these things from what existed. 
and the human race came into existence in the same way. And okay. so it, it kind of sounds like creation ex nihilo, and people are like, that's definitely creation ex nihilo. God did not make these things, the universe around you, from what existed. And so case closed, or so everybody thought. <laughs> it's gun, dun, dun. Yeah. So uh, the Greek there is, um, did not make these things ex onton, which is out of the being stuff, mm. or what bees, what, it, what is, what exists. <laughs> and this is actually uh, referring, as, as most scholars today agree, to a traditional Greek philosophical concept uh, that we find most clearly in Aristotle, but is found elsewhere, that matter exists either in a state of being or non-being. Mm. And it all comes down to whether or not it has form and function. And so you can just have unorganized, chaotic matter. And according to Aristotle, that is existing in, in a state or a realm of non-being. But once you impose form and function on it, you have moved it into a state of being. So he has this, this statement uh, in a text called On the Generation of Animals. Aristotle says, for generation is from non-being into being. Generation meaning creation. Right. And corruption from being again into non-being. Okay. And so when things deteriorate, yeah. they go from having form and function to, to not having form and function. To being soggy and gross. Yes. And stuff that you don't want to eat <laughs> um, or play with or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so the author of uh, 2 Maccabees 7.28 is saying the heavens and earth were created, uk ex onton, or not out of being stuff. And so the idea is adopting this Greek philosophical view that basically God took unformed, unorganized, chaotic matter and squished it together and shaped it and made little eyes and a nose and, and created human uh, well, created the universe. And then as the, the verse goes on to state... The human race came into existence in the same way. Right. Which is definitely not out of nothing. The human race, even according to Genesis, was created out of being stuff. Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, was created out of the dust of the earth, according to Genesis 2. Right. Um, and so, yeah, this is not a case of creation ex nihilo. This is a creation of creation ex... Uh, this is a case of creation ex materia. Uh, and we've even got a bunch of passages in the New Testament that people will cite and say, well, at least this is very clearly creation ex nihilo. Um, so we've got uh, Romans 4.17, where uh, Paul concludes by referring to God as the one who calls into existence the things that do not exist. And that's how the NRSV uh, translates it. But this things that do not exist is a different... Different Greek words to say the same thing. Ta me onta, which is the non-being things. Um, it is um, a neuter plural instead of a masculine plural word for being. and So mm. it's the same idea. And then we've got Hebrews 11.3. Uh, by faith we understand that the universe was ordered by God's word so that what is seen came from what is not visible. And so people will be like, well, what is not visible obviously means, you know, nothing. <laughs> means it doesn't exist. Doesn't exist, yeah, because if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, but others have pointed out, we go to Colossians 1.16, we got the invisible features of God's creation, which are the powers, thrones, dominions, rulers, and so forth. And, and these are um, always understood as divine forces. They're, they're just not seen. Right. Uh, they're invisible, so that, that, that's obviously not creation ex nihilo either. Yeah, we so, would. I mean, one would point out that God Himself is unseen and yet is also there. Here according to a lot of New Testament to. authors, yeah, God is is themselves unseen, but exists uh, according to those New Testament authors. Yeah. Now the. What the apologists who are aware of the current academic consensus but don't like it um, <laughs> will, will go on to argue is that in the New Testament, we have repeated references to God being the creator of all things. And the idea is, if God created all things, then obviously God, uh, the, it came out of nothing. 
And and this is a pretty strained argument because uh, it would have to mean that this extends to all things that exist or that have ever existed. In other words, nothing could exist that was not created by God, including material that pre-existed creation by God. But that's that's expanding the rhetorical scope of these statements well beyond what was obviously intended by the authors, because the the New Testament authors are very clearly trying to make the case that God has sovereignty over all things. What things specifically? Well, the things that are around us right now. Yeah. So there's a temporal scope to this rhetoric. It's talking about now, now. Yeah. That was then, this is now. Um, when will then be now? Soon. Um <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we we still don't have any any concept of uh, creation ex nihilo, and we also have in the in the New Testament there are there are plenty of places where people use that word panta, uh, which means all things in ways that obviously don't actually mean all things. Uh, the woman at the well in John four goes to uh, her town and says to the people, "Come see a man who told me all things that I have done." Uh, you had a long conversation <laughs> yeah. if Jesus told you literally all things that you have ever done. Right. Um, and uh, in Matthew 17, 11, uh, Jesus says Elijah is going to return to restore all things. Don't think that literally all things that have ever existed um, down to the minutest atom will be restored. So the it's not taking seriously the the rhetorical context of uh, of these phrases in the New Testament, so there's just no case to make that uh, we find creation ex nihilo in the Hebrew Bible, in Second Maccabees seven twenty eight in the New Testament. We don't see it anywhere in the Bible or the literature that was composed around the same time as the Bible. What we see is the earliest Christians agreeing with the conventional wisdom that matter is eternal, that matter goes all the way back, uh, that um, out of nothing, nothing can come. But things start to change in the second century, because in the second century, we've got this uh, effort on the parts of Christians to intellectualize the gospel. The apologists Mm -hmm. take over. These are educated folks who are trying to make the gospel palatable for the Greco-Roman intelligentsia so that the gospel can then, um, you know, be disseminated on on a higher social level rather than the traditional notion of Christianity as a religion for women and slaves, Mm. which is how it's described right when we get into the second century CE. Interesting. And we have these, these debates between Christians and Gnostics and other Greek thinkers, philosophers, arguers um, about the one um, morality of eternal matter and two, the rationality of the resurrection. Because within the Greek philosophical mindset, uh, the only thing that is divine and eternal and unchanging is spirit. The flesh is corrupt and dumb and you know, we just don't like it. We want to get rid of it. And this is why in the Gnostic worldview, salvation is about escaping the prison of our fleshly bodies so that our spirits can ascend to the Pleroma uh, and be w- one with the divine forever. And so you basically have Christians going, oh no, our bodies are going to be resurrected and we're going to live eternally in fleshly bodies. And they're like, why would we want these <laughs> to live forever, basically uh, strapped to this pigsty that we're trying to get away from. Like they didn't, they didn't like these the are the idea. worst part. Yeah, and it was like, hey, you know, these bodies die; they get uh, consumed by animals and then ejected as waste from animals. And you're saying that that excrement is going to come out <laughs> and reconstitute the body, and we're going to. Um, just live like this forever, that's gross. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of criticism of the idea of the resurrection. And you have arguments that begin with this idea of, oh, well, you know, God can uh, God can create uh, a, a human being out of what begins as just a tiny little bit 
of matter so God can reconstitute a body that has been burned to cinders or that has been consumed by an animal that has, uh, you know, deteriorated at the bottom of the sea. Mm. Uh, that's not a big obstacle for God. But then there's also the problem of the morality of eternal matter. If you've got matter existing eternally and matter is dumb and corrupt and changing, then it exists eternally apart from God, and God is not sovereign over it. And it just creates this kind of tension with the way, the direction Christians are wanting to go with how they're representing God within the Greco-Roman milieu. If we want to make this sound rational and reasonable to Greek thinking people, we have to do something about this. And uh, the idea that we get is that uh, matter and and the divine are not uh, co-eternal twin principles. And I think the first person who clearly articulates this idea that, no, God created all matter from nothing, which is a flagrant violation of the conventional wisdom about, you know, how matter exists. Um, so uh, this uh, guy, Tatian, who was a student of Justin Martyr, around 170 CE, he's he's got this text called Address to the Greeks, where he argues that uh, that God created all matter out of nothing. And um, I've got a quote here, neither is matter without cause, as is God, nor is it equal in power to God because it is without cause. It was generated, and it was not generated by anyone else, but it was expressed only by the demiurge of all. Therefore, we believe that there will be a resurrection of bodies after the consummation of everything. So it kind of combines both of these ideas. Matter is not co-eternal with God, and the resurrection is not stupid. And (laughs) Shut up. Yeah, shut up, man. Um, And... We have the first articulation of creation ex nihilo, of creation out of nothing, right. and then we have and, uh, and, and the first ex, uh, the, the the first mention of the the special pleading for God, the uncaused <laughs> causer, yeah, where not everything else was caused, but that doesn't have to apply to him. <laughs> well, and and that goes back a little further with uh, uh, with Platonic philosophy, but certainly the the first use of that argument to uh, to defend Christianity and its belief that we're all going to be uh, our our soggy, messy, fleshly <laughs> bodies are going to be resurrected. Yeah. Um, and then we've got this dude named Theophilus of Antioch who comes after Tatian. And uh, he mocked the Platonists who believed that matter existed t- eternally and argued that God created all matter. Um, around 180 CE, uh, he wrote in a text that just as God is changeless because he is ungenerated, so also if matter is ungenerated, it is also changeless and equal to God. For that which is generated is mutable and changeable, the ungenerated is immutable and unchangeable. Therefore, matter can't be co-equal and co-eternal with God, uh, and we have to have this idea of creation out of nothing. Hey, everybody. It is the middle of summer. It is hot out there. I hope you have had an opportunity to get outside, get moving. Maybe you've got a health routine that you're working on, some wellness goals you're working towards. You can meet those wellness goals with Factor, thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's got fresh, never-frozen meals that are dietitian approved, and they're ready in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great-tasting meals and progress towards a newer, healthier routine. Yeah, you know, it can be such an easy part of your life to eat well if you want to. Uh, Factor has 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week. You'll always have new flavors to explore. So enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle. No shopping, no prepping, no cooking or cleanup. It's just two minutes. You can choose from six menu preferences to help you manage your calories to maximize protein intake. You can avoid meat if you want to, or you can just eat a well-balanced meal. 
Head to factormeals.com slash dogma50 and use code dogma50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code dogma50 at factormeals.com slash dogma50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. I find that so interesting. Like, I just quickly, I... This idea, because what you just said, that argument, the thing doesn't follow for me. Like (laughs) these two things share one set of uh, of of uh, features that is eternality and therefore they're equal. I don't know why that would necessarily follow, but okay, fine. (laughs) Well, there there is an idea in in some philosophical surface uh, surfaces. What circles? Sure, um, that circles. (laughs) <laughs> circles makes more sense than surfaces um that uh, what comes before is superior what comes uh-huh. after is inferior and so if matter and deity neither precedes the other then uh, chronologically at least and therefore morally um they are equal i mean it um, makes sense i'm older than my sister and i'm way better than she is so that makes <laughs> there, there's some logic to that i can see that um, I can see that too. Uh, I'm older than my brother, but he's like three inches taller than me. So that's the only the only part <laughs> where our relationship just uh, totally violates these natural laws. So um, <laughs> you, sh- you should tell him that you violate <laughs> oh, natural have, laws. <laughs> um, and so we once we get this idea, then we have Christians looking back on those passages that we talked about. And stroking their beards and clucking their tongues and saying, hey, look at that, creation ex nihilo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they look back at Romans, and they look back at Second Maccabees 7.28, and they look back at these passages. And there's another one, Shepherd of Hermas uh, 26.1. This is, this is part of, this is a text written around 100 CE, didn't make it into the Bible ultimately, but was included in some of our earliest uh, editions of the Bible. I think yeah, it's I, in Sinaiticus. I can see why it didn't make it in. That just the, even the name just sounds like they made it up. <laughs> yeah. That's just made up. Uh, but uh, in the Shepherd of Hermas, it says, "Truly, then the Scripture declared, which says, first of all, believe that there is one God who has established all things and completed them, and having ca- and having caused that from what had no being, all things should come into existence." Um, and so they're now saying, "Hey, look at these passages." This is all confirmation of creation ex nihilo. So basically, we came up with this new way of thinking about creation, and that became the interpretive lens. And then when they turned that interpretive lens back on the biblical text that never meant that before, it was like, ah, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. It all fits together. Everything's working, baby. Yeah. um, Everything uh, in its place and a place for everything. I think I probably got that backwards, but I don't know. It'll be fine. We'll survive. (laughs) And then um, we have later uh, kind of authoritative Christian philosophers, uh, Tertullian, Origen, Augustine, Aquinas, and others kind of come in and further flesh out um, how this all fits within the Christian worldview as well as within um, a philosophical uh, kind of canon. They make it philosophically defensible. Um, they, they set up the, um, the reinforcements for it. And then, you know, by the time you get to the medieval period and then into the Enlightenment, it is rock solid, baby. It is in the foundation of, uh, of Christian theology. And so when we get to the creation of monotheism in the 17th century with uh, Henry Moore and Ralph Cudworth and the deists in the, uh, in the 18th century— Creation ex nihilo is is just presupposed and, in fact, forms the foundation of the concept of of monotheism. So these things are are all interrelated. Um, right. Ultimately, in the long run, that's 
that's how it turns out. But um, but yeah, totally made up. Uh, second century CE. That's that's <laughs> nutty. Uh, I yeah, I, it's it's so funny because you know I've had conversations online with people. I've had conversations in person with people who presuppose ex nihilo creation to the point where, like, even questioning it makes you like her- heretical, utterly heretical. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then and now they're going through and they're sort of backfilling it with f- like astrophysics and uh, you know all of the stuff that we're here that, that we hear every the you know every time a new the word quantum comes into the picture it's just like okay you got all right there you go <laughs> there's uh, a there there's definitely an apologetic uh argument these days where it would be like uh you know even Stephen Hawking thinks that the universe was created or or there was a time when it didn't exist or something like that it's like well that kind of misrepresents the uh the physics a little bit but um yeah the the doctrine didn't exist when the bible was being written right uh and there are there are a bunch of wonderful books on this if anybody wants to read up uh, there's a book by uh, Gerhard May from the 90s called Creation uh, Ex Nihilo. Uh, James Hubler uh, wrote a doctoral dissertation, I think, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, on Creation Ex Nihilo and talks about um, the philosophical discussion uh, all the way up through to uh, Aquinas. There, uh, Marcus Bachmuel and Anderson have an edited volume on creation ex nihilo, where they're they're talking about um, a lot of moral and theological implications. But like the first chapter of this edited volume is is saying basically, yeah, eh, we have the building blocks. We don't mm-hmm. have a clear articulation until the second century CE. But um, you know, it's biblical ish. Yeah. Um, so there's um, there's a, a pretty widespread acknowledgement that the idea was not articulated until 171 AD CE, uh, wow. which, yeah, but but if you question it today, for a lot of people, it just totally undercuts God's sovereignty. How can it possibly be that God is not the creator of all of the material that exists in the universe? And that's um, that I, I think shows that a lot of people are are operating in their theology not on the level of the biblical text or the biblical authors, but on the philosophical level, mm. which is which is this uh, this conceptual fortress that is constructed in the thousand years after the Bible was written, not during the writing of the Bible. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's we're we're gonna switch gears then. Uh, gonna downshift. We we're gonna As, like like Rocky too. Yeah, in that, exactly. in that Porsche, just <laughs> and down shit. <laughs> All right, let's do a chapter and verse. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this chapter and verse is fascinating. We are we we're back into the uh, the apocrypha. Uh, we 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 spent a little bit of, uh, a moment or two in the Maccabees uh, in the first half of the show. Now we're uh, we're in. Bell and Sebastian, I mean Bell and the Dragon, and I will never be able to get it right because uh that's just what's gonna pop into my head. But uh Bell and the Dragon, which I was only made aware look, I didn't I don't know the Apocrypha. I never read any of the Apocrypha before very recently. Uh I wasn't raised with it, certainly. And so when someone told me that there was a biblical book called Bell and the Dragon, I got very, very excited. When I found out it was an actual dragon, I got even excited her because that's <laughs> amazing. Uh, and then when I found out that these are stories of a beloved biblical character that we already know, uh, I thought, oh, that's really cool. So take us in, man. What do we got? So uh, we're in... The part of the Apocrypha that is known as uh, the editions, and this means that they're not independent books. It's not First and Second Maccabees. Uh, it's not uh, those independent books, but it's versions of things from the Hebrew Bible that were probably added later on. And so this is actually chapter 14 of the Greek version of the book of Daniel. Oh, okay. And so it, it's it's an additional chapter that's tacked on at the uh, the end of Daniel, 
and was probably um, written in Greek uh, and added into the book of Daniel. And there are there's an argument to make. In fact, a lot of scholars think that uh, this story of, uh, particularly the story of Daniel in the lion's den, comes from before the story that actually gets preserved in the canonical book of Daniel. Really? Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. And, so, and you said this was in Greek. Was the book of Daniel, what what language was the book of Daniel originally written? Um, so some of it was Hebrew, some of it was Aramaic. Okay. But it comes to it comes together in the final form as we know it. Dates can date no earlier than uh, the early 160s BCE. Okay. So um, it is. It came together fairly, uh, fairly late. Right. And um, the story is uh, we have this kind of contest uh, between Daniel and the priests of Bel, where the Babylonians have this idol called Bell, and, and this is probably related to Baal. Um, mm. And every day they provide it for it, provided for it 12 bushels of choice flour and 40 sheep and six measures of wine. And this, uh, by the way, this story does answer, we had, uh, after we talked about, um, I don't remember what specifically we talked about, but we were talking about, oh, we were talking about ancestor worship, and we were talking about people leaving offerings for mm-hmm. ancestors and that sort of thing. And there was some question among some of our listeners about did they think that these that their ancestors or that the what whoever the idol was whoever the, the these offerings were going to did these people think that they were actually eating them because we talked about how they people wanted to be provided food mm-hmm. in their afterlife and did they think they were actually eating it because surely it just sat there. Like you know, if you take it into your family, your ancestral whatever, the food just stays. But this is an awful lot of food to just stick around. Yeah, yeah, and and th- there were a few different ways they did these uh, like funerary meals and stuff. One way was just they just ate in their presence. So the 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 living people are consuming the uh, the food themselves. Right. Another way is is the burnt offering idea that by burning it, you're allowing the uh, the sustenance to take smoke form and rise up or something like that. And then the other way was just putting stuff in the tomb. And then, you know, you wouldn't see it for a year. And guess what? The chicken wing has deteriorated um, in <laughs> in the year. Um, and if they're boneless, then, you know, there's nothing left. So, right. um, which is probably what the, the deceased folks pref- prefer anyway, because... <laughs> uh, the you know the gristle just gets in the way. Um, so yeah, what you've got here is is a, is basically uh, they're mocking how they were were trying to represent the consumption of the the offerings. Um, so uh, the king says to Daniel, "Do you not think that Bell is a living god? Do you not see how much he eats and drinks every day?" And and Daniel guffaws. <laughs> and said, do not be deceived, O king, for this thing is only clay inside and bronze outside, and it has never eaten or drunk anything. So we've got some idle mockery going yeah. on here. We've got It's bold. Yeah. And this is this king, by the way, is uh is Cyrus, right? Yeah, it, it is Cyrus. Um okay. and so uh Daniel's like, ha ha ha, you fool. Um the deity is not eating these things. And the king is angry and calls all the priests of, of Bel and uh, says, um, you know, we got we to gotta prove that, uh, that this deity is eating all these things. And the priests of Bel had a little trap door uh, <laughs> they were inside. Sneaky. Yeah, they were sneaky. And they, they would come in at night, uh, you know, the, the doors are all shut and locked. Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember from Dr. No, uh, James Bond does a little boink, takes out a little hair and licks it and puts it across the, between the door and the frame so that he can <laughs> tell if someone has opened this door. Right. You know, they've got all that in place. Yeah. Um, but because they've got this trap door in, inside, they can sneak in and they can eat all the food themselves. It's not exactly David Blaine levels of, of <laughs> magic. It's a, yeah. it's a pretty obvious trick, but, uh, they haven't told anybody about it. So so when Cyrus is like, we're going to put this to the test. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Dan- Daniel's like, all right, well, we'll put it to the test. They go in, they put in all the food. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Daniel has an extra, like, 
da- Daniel's going full amazing Randy on this one. Was- <laughs> yeah, this this is where it would have been really nice to have Gallagher uh, come in and. <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a reference to a, a totally different podcast. Call back to uh, our our time on um, God Awful Movies, the podcast. Yeah. So um, Daniel's like, "Hey, King, check this out. Uh, everybody's gone for the evening. You and I are the only ones here. We're gonna take a bunch of ash. We're just gonna sprinkle ash around everywhere. Yeah. And uh, and the priests don't know about this. So it's dark. They are tripping over each other. They come out of the trap door. They go munch on the food." Uh, and then, uh, and it's head not back just down. the priests, by the way. It's the priests, their wives, and yeah, all of families. their children. It is like, <laughs> and and there are seventy priests, I think. So it is, it's mayhem in there. Yeah. And uh, and then the next day, uh, Daniel and the king show up, and the priests are like, "Ha! The food is gone." And Daniel's like, "Oh my gosh, look at the floor, everybody." Yeah. And uh, the that? king says, I see the footprints of men and women and children. Then the king was enraged, and he arrested the priests and their wives and children, and they showed him the secret doors which they used to enter to consume what was on the table, and therefore the king put them to death and yeah. gave Bell over to Daniel, who destroyed it and its temple. So this is anti-idol polemics, yeah, um, which has kind of taken a, um, you know, this—, this uh, Probably brings a tear of appreciation to the eye of some of the more militant of the uh, of the online atheists <laughs> these days. Um, that uh, maybe not that people were killed, but the fact that uh, that Daniel was able to cleverly uh, expose the ruse. Yeah, um, but it does get it. One of the things that it sort of points out is that, at very least, according to the story, the. The king Cyrus actually believed that this that this god was eating all of this food. Yeah. So so I, I at very least the story claims that people believed that. I don't know how I don't know how much how much people actually believed it, but that that's interesting. Uh so there you go Daniel has has slain one god, he is the god slayer. Mm-hmm. Uh and now but that god was just a statue. Yeah. Uh, which is but pff, anybody can prove a statue's not a god. <laughs> but who can what but his next task it, it's starting to feel like the 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 tasks of Hercules or something. <laughs> because he he gets he gets another there's an he's, he's confronted by another more differenter god and that is <laughs> a dragon. It's Trogdor. Don't don't Trogdor. <laughs> uh so so yeah uh that where where does this come from do we have any sense because this is not this is not like uh a metaphor or something this is like no. this the story is the king's like oh yeah well what about the dragon though <laughs> that's a god right yeah so what does he so, say? You cannot deny that this is a living God. Yeah. So, so worship, worship him. him. Yeah. yeah. So what what's going on there? So uh, um, <sighs> dragon slash serpent, and this is this is based on earlier mythology associated with like Leviathan, uh, mm-hmm. which is a serpent slash dragon. We've talked about that Isaiah twenty seven one, Psalm seventy four, bunch of places. Job, uh, you know the. <laughs> On on Twitter, I think I saw the best summary of uh, of the book of Job, and it was God saying to uh, Job, "Going, uh, what's up with all the suffering?" And God saying, "How dare you speak that way to the inventor of the hippopotamus?" Um, but <laughs> so the Leviathan is this classical mythological chaos dragon monster sea serpent, right? And so in this period, the idea is that there were these things in antiquity. Uh, and and this is being written probably in the second century BCE, third or second century BCE. And so, uh, you know, the Babylonian exile is hoary antiquity. And so maybe the dragons were around back then. Yeah. So, so you know, Cyrus is like, well, what about the dragon down there? <laughs> <laughs> you got a little dragon over there. No, no, it is a great dragon. It says so right <laughs> in verse 23. <laughs> 
And um, and Daniel says, I worship the Lord my God, for he is a living God. But give me permission, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. The king said, I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll and, allow it. Just this once. <laughs> so Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and boiled them together and made cakes. And I think I've had one of these cakes before, but um, <laughs> yeah, if you've ever, if you, it, it's dense, but it's, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, well, and boy, get... it is. Dragons cannot resist. Yeah, they. Um, that's their Achilles heel. <laughs> uh, and he fed him to the dragon. And there's a, if you get the uh, SBL Study Bible, um, there's a wonderful um, 16th century painting of Daniel slaying the dragon. Oh, uh, I love it. By a um a Dutch um artist. And it shows Daniel feeding these cakes to a dragon <laughs> who's kind of like, oh, I've had enough. <laughs> no more. Um, but uh and the the dragon eats them and explodes. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Uh poor Trogdor. He is done. Uh, <laughs> Daniel. And then Daniel, Daniel says, see what you've been worshiping. Yeah. Uh, the idea being, hey. If this thing can, um, you know, if this thing can get aced by, you know, a, a rough cake, yeah. then, um, you know, you don't have a god. You have uh, something with a pretty weak constitution. <laughs> you, have, you have a dragon, which is pretty darn cool. I I feel like, you know, I get that he didn't want him to worship the dragon and that, that like, you know, if you're claiming godship for the dragon, that's probably not right, but... Don't kill the dra- don't blow up a dragon <laughs> with cakes just to make a point. That a dragon's a cool thing to have, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the, the, but but because God is uh, you know the destroyer of of the leviathan and yeah. um, the tamer of the savage beast, they're representing Daniel as as wielding the same power. Um, yeah. But th- then the Babylonians are upset. Because you know you killed our dragon, <laughs> you killed you killed our statue and our dragon. Yeah, this this sucks. And then the they make a weird um, accusation, and they were very indignant and conspired against the king, saying the king has become a Jew. He has destroyed Bel and killed the dragon and slaughtered the priests. Yeah, going to the king, they said, "Hand Daniel over to us, or we will kill you and your household." Wow. We, yeah, I, I don't know if this is... Uh, is this all the Babylonians? Right. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of an eat the rich situation where the yeah. whole the whole uh, town is, is just like, we outnumber you significantly. Yeah, Cyrus didn't seem to have a handle on this uh, yeah. <laughs> particular situation. Yeah. Uh, the king saw that they were pressing him hard, and under compulsion, he handed Daniel over to them. At which point, Daniel gets thrown where? In the lion's den, right? Which is so. which differs from the other account of of why Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, which was right. And also a, the 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 account of Daniel being in the lion's den because here he's in there for six days. Yeah, yeah. It's not he's, just like the lions are hungry. And it's if not, you're wondering to yourself, how did Daniel eat for six days? What what happened? Oh, we've got a story for that. <laughs> but but first, you got to know that these lions are voracious. Because normally, well, that's true. there were seven lions in the den, and every day they had been given two human bodies and two sheep. But now they were giving nothing so that they would devour Daniel. Um, and then and then we've got a cameo. Yeah, the prophet Habakkuk shows up, and um, he <laughs> <laughs> just just. Uh, Incidentally, yeah, this he's just, here. and he's chilling far away from there. He's all the way in Judea, mm-hmm. uh, and he and he's hanging out, and uh, he's made a stew, which is nice. That sounds delicious, as, as one does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and suddenly, <laughs> you imagine he's sitting down, he's got it all <laughs> laid out nice, and he's like, "Ooh, I get some stew. It's stew and then, time, and, baby." And then who shows up? <laughs> the angel of the Lord. <laughs> says says take this to Babylon and yeah. give it to Daniel, which and Habakkuk's like I don't what can I make him another can I can I make him another stew when I get there that's like a ways away <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm low on gas and you need a jacket um, so he says sir I have never seen Babylon and I know nothing about the den. 
Then the angel of the Lord took him by the crown of his head and carried him by his hair. <laughs> so the angel was just like, <laughs> nope, you you're stupid coming. little. <laughs> <laughs> With a gust of wind, he set him down in Babylon right over the den. W- uh, presumably with the stew in tow. Right. Yeah. Like he was like, grab the stew, pick grab it up. Grab your stew, pick it up. we're going. <laughs> you'd think, you know, you'd think they'd have other modes of transportation, but the dragon is dead. So all you got is a gust of wind and some <laughs> hair grabbing. Yeah. Uh, and then Habakkuk shouted, Daniel, Daniel, take the food that God has sent you. Um, it sounds like the angel could have just taken Habakkuk's food because Habakkuk right? is out of the picture. <laughs> it, it does seem like an, a, a very elaborate way yeah. to get food to and, Daniel. Uh, yeah, picking him up by his hair and then flying him. <laughs> He's kind of like, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> and Daniel says, you have remembered me, O God, and have not abandoned those who love you. So Daniel got up and ate, and the angel of God immediately returned Habakkuk to his own place. <laughs> so you, you're not at needed which, anymore. At which point Habakkuk said, was all of this necessary? Yeah, Why was I involved in this? <laughs> now I got to go make some more stew. <laughs> Just, my head hurts. I'm out of stew. This is yeah. terrible. And then on the seventh day, the king came to mourn for Daniel when he came to the den, he looked in, and there sat Daniel, exclamation point. The king shouted with a loud voice, You are great, O Lord, the God of Daniel, and there is no other besides you. Then he pulled Daniel out and threw into the den those who had attempted his destruction, and they were instantly eaten before his eyes. The rest of the nation of Babylon he threw into the den? Because it <laughs> sounded like it was all of them. Um, yeah, yeah. The the people who came to the king and was like, we're going to kill you if you don't do this. And the king's like, I give, I give. Right. Um, this is this is probably not Gallagher and the two stooges um, <laughs> from uh, from the book of Daniel. From the movie. Um, <laughs> l- let me ask you this. Uh, was, because I'm not remembering my book of Daniel, uh, like the book, well enough. Was the king that threw Daniel into the lion's den in Daniel, was that Cyrus? Or was because I don't, I don't remember which king it was that threw, but I don't think it was Cyrus, was it? So it's a post Babylonian king, but it's Darius who oh, is okay. represented in the Book of Daniel as the uh, the Median king who defeats Babylon, and then Cyrus comes after Darius. Okay, um, I imagine this this other text might be representing Cyrus as as the one who um, conquers. Uh, Babylon, oh, but okay. if it if it is integrated into the rest of book of the book of Daniel, then it was probably following their chronology, even yeah. though it comes after all of the apocalyptic visions and everything from chapters seven through twelve. So, um, yeah, it is. So, where did the so up until the apocrypha was sort of yeeted out of the Bible? <laughs> did this did this just sit? Next to it, like wh- what happened with this? Why, why was it in? Why wasn't it? You know, why was it? I, I guess I can see why it was rejected, why it was uh, scooted out. But just sort of give me the because it it doesn't seem like it aligns with the rest of the you know with the book of Daniel, for example. Yeah. Yeah, well, none of the book of Daniel seems to align with the rest of the book of Daniel. But um, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> you, you got to remember uh, for early Christianity, their Bible was the Septuagint, mm. which was the Greek translation, and so this was part of the Greek translation. So when they get together and are like, "All right, these are our books; these are our guys; this this is our canon," and they put it together, our earliest editions of a codex with all of the text of the Bible in one volume, are these Greek editions. And so they have these texts that were either composed in Greek or primarily circulated in Greek, including these editions. And so this was just a part of the Bible. Um, When we get to the Vulgate, Jerome is including most of of what is in the, the Greek Septuagint. Uh, And so this is just part of the Bible until we get down to the Protestant Reformation, at which point um, now Christianity is is doing their thing with their version of the Bible, but Judaism is actually just focusing on the texts that are circulated in Hebrew. So right. their version of Daniel 
is Hebrew and Aramaic. It's not Greek. And so it doesn't include these additions. And so by the time we get down to Martin Luther, in the beginning of the 16th century CE, he wants to translate his own version of the Bible. And he's like, now nah, we're, we're doing... The, we're doing the Greek New Testament, and then we're going back to the Hebrew. He learns Hebrew, he, he learns how to translate, um, and goes back to the Jewish manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. And so he's like, hey, all this other stuff isn't here. Instead of just having it um, you know, integrated into the Old Testament, I'm going to take them out, and I'm going to go put them over here in an entirely separate section. In, right. in the, I think the first edition, it was like an appendix. Everything was moved to the back. And he also moved James and Hebrews and Revelation and a bunch of New Testament texts to the back that he didn't like. In subsequent editions, he was like, fine, I'll restore the New Testament stuff, <laughs> but I, I'm going to put the other texts, the Apocrypha, in their own section. Right. And so it goes Old Testament, Apocrypha, New Testament. And so we, uh, what Martin Luther does is, is basically isolates and separates the Apocrypha and creates a, a third volume within the Bible known as the Apocrypha that then, in the 19th century, publishers are like, meh. Um, and, and <laughs> this that is, is just where, taking up pages. I don't yeah, need just, that. Just valuable pages that uh, costing us money. Yeah. Um, and so the combination of Protestantism's kind of uh, demotion of the Apocrypha to its own segment, and then its treatment of the Apocrypha as not as inspired as the rest of the text result ultimately in its ejection from the canon by the end of the 19th century. Okay. Well, I mean, it makes sense that this was the the, the Greek part that was not included in the Hebrew part. I, I guess I, I now I see the logic of that. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. So well, there does, you go. There is a logic to it all. It's not all entirely arbitrary. <laughs> um, but th there are some fascinating stories uh, like this in the Apocrypha. Highly, highly recommend um, getting, getting yourself a, a, an edition of the Bible that includes the Apocrypha uh, so that you can check some of these stories out. Yeah, we're, pe people who are, who are you know, living without the Apocrypha, they're, they're living without dragons, people. This is, this is Targaryen <laughs> stuff. I, yeah, I, there, I, there be dragons there. Um, yeah. So, you know, how can you turn that down? And um, we've, uh, we've talked about the Apocrypha and on the show before, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, so, yeah. Um, again, highly recommend Introduction to the Apocrypha, Jewish Books in Christian Bibles by Lawrence Wills from 2021. Great discussion. Nice. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. I uh, I enjoyed that thoroughly. I really, I really, just uh, yeah. Bell and the it's Dragon just a delightful are... little story. They they um they're not beating around the bush. They're cutting right to the chase. Yeah, and it is incisive. It is, um, it is punchy. Yeah, uh, it's, just it's a some. Great it's story. literally my favorite part of the Bible that I've ever read. Uh, I've, <laughs> I I haven't read the whole thing cover to cover. I've read a lot of it, uh, and I think that. Uh, Bell and the Dragon is probably my favorite little chapter that there is. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, uh, you and I, Dan, are now going to adjourn to the after party where all of our patrons at the ten dollar level and up can can hang out with us for a little bit more. For the rest awesome. of you, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to contact us, the email address is contact at dataoverdogmapod dot com. We, we sure do appreciate you checking in with us, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody. Data Over Dogma is a member of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. It is a production of Data Over Dogma Media, LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.